I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Dr. Brian Keating, physicist extraordinaire, Professor Keating, famous for almost winning the Nobel, or I should say famous for losing the Nobel Prize. I don't know how close you were to almost winning, but we definitely know you lost. <laughs> That's true. And I always ask the same question, but I'll ask it again. Like, and, and I'll just remind people, you built a huge telescope in Antarctica, millions of dollars worth of telescope to see the gravitational waves that were before the cosmic background radiation, because light can't get through that, with the idea that maybe you could peak into the secrets of the universe and see the Big Bang itself by measuring the gravitational waves from before the cosmic background radiation started. And your tel- do you think your telescope could have done it if it was like fully working? Well, yeah, I mean, the telescope worked as good as it possibly could work. And it was actually so, uh, so optimally designed that it made a measurement that hasn't been superseded upon, improved upon in the foregoing you know, eight years since we made this announcement in 2014, the subject of losing the Nobel Prize. And so it's only gotten more and more strong, the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, but the thing that we measured was not what we intended to measure. And so we wanted to measure these gravitational waves, which is kind of like the shrapnel or the fossil relic of the so-called inflationary epoch, where inflation is the spark that ignited the Big Bang. Theoretically. And theoretically, we're not sure it happened. And it's funny because I just explained all this to Neil deGrasse Tyson. I was, you know, humble, humble brag, just on his <laughs> Star Talk podcast um, after, you know, never really expecting to be on it after uh, he basically, you know, called me a racist a long time ago. Uh, but we, we, patched, we hugged it out virtually, and I love that guy. Uh, but I was explaining to him, and he's an expert, and he's just like, oh, you got you to, gotta like, slow it down. You got to slow it down. So I, I know the James Altucher, you know, audience is amongst the most brilliant in the universe, at least. Very true. Perhaps right after Into the Impossible audience. But it's still a very difficult concept to grasp. You know, how did the universe come to be the way we observe it to be? So we have only very circumstantial evidence. We don't have any real pro- provatory or dispositive evidence. Well, and you and I even done a, a bunch of podcasts about all the different theories. I didn't realize how many theories there are as yeah. opposed to just the Big Bang. 
Uh, and they're all legit theories as to how the universe started. Completely, yeah. And people think it's it's just completely cemented at the level of, you know, say the theory of gravity or something like that, which also has, you know, certain gaps in our understanding of it. But to actually go and get evidence as, you know, my hero, Galileo, Galilei, as you know, and we'll probably which talk Which we're going to talk, talk about your hero. Including and- a couple of firsts inspired by you, but we'll get to that um, in a bit. Um, and Galileo said a scientist should measure what's measurable and make measurable what is not so. So in other words, if something can be measured, go out and do it. If you can't measure it, do your damnedest to make sure you try to make that measurement while you can. And that's sort of what we aspired to do. And how do you measure something that's, that doesn't exist, right? The Big Bang doesn't exist now. There is no Big Bang happening right now. So all you could do is hope to capture something, some evidence, however circumstantial it is, of what actually caused the universe to get into its current state, not necessarily how it began in directly observing such an, such the phenomenon. Right. And, and when we use a normal telescope or even just our eyes to look out into the universe and we see a star, for instance, we're seeing that star as it appeared maybe millions of years ago, because we're seeing the light of that star after it's already traveled a distance to earth. Right. Yeah. And, right. And the right. idea would be, well, why can't we see even further? Why can't we see all the way back to the beginning of the universe? And the problem is, as, as you and I have discussed before, about 300,000 years after the universe began, presumably this, this plasma developed all the way back then that is thicker than light. Light can't get through it. So we actually That's can't right. see any light beyond 300,000 years after the universe was created. And the, your theory was, and not your theory, but it was, it was a practical, goal. An, yeah, experiment, goal an, an experiment, an experimental goal yeah. based on on this theory that well, gravitational waves can be seen through the cosmic ba- background yeah, radiation right. as opposed to light waves. So you built a telescope for that, and were you, were you able to see some gravitational waves beyond the cosmic background radiation? So what we ended up seeing, and everything you said is, is actually correct. It was um, it was not the gravitational wave signal that we had sought to observe. Instead, we saw this kind of imposter signal, uh, which was masquerading as um, as the identical signal that you would see if inflation did take place. But it was caused not by inflation, <clears throat> not by the Big Bang itself, but by particles of cosmic dust in our Milky Way galaxy that produced a pattern of light that exactly replicated the signals we were looking for. And so it's kind of an example of what's called confirmation bias, which is one of uh, the you know, cardinal sins of science. So you're looking for something, oh, I found it, you know, we must have succeeded. You know, I hate it when people ask me, what do you hope to discover? You know, because it's, it's very perilous. Like, you wouldn't ask your doctor that, like, what do you hope to discover, you know, in my CAT scan of my brain? And n- nothing, I hope you discover nothing, <laughs> right? Um, so, um, but just to go back one, one sec and to what you said, um, an interesting fact, you said absolutely correctly, when the universe uh, was was in its most hot, dense, primordial state, it was what we call a plasma. A plasma, sometimes called the fourth state of matter in addition to solid, liquid, and gas, there's this plasma. Plasma are uh, bundles, associations, huge amounts of ions, electrons or protons, or my favorite particle, the crouton. Uh, the uh, the particles that existed in uh, before c- combining the protons and neutrons and and uh, and electrons to make hydrogen and helium and the elements on the periodic table of the elements. Um, but before that, the, the universe is a fusion reactor and you can't see inside of a fusion reactor. And the proof of that is if you go outside and, you know, don't look directly at it, but you know if you look at the sun, you can't see inside the sun to where these reactions are occurring. The sunlight that you see uh, started on its journey not eight minutes ago, which so the sun is eight light minutes away from the Earth, meaning that it takes light, the fastest possible traveling um, uh, particles of photons. It takes those traveling at 186,000 miles a second. It takes them eight minutes to travel 93 million miles. And you can check my math, James. Uh, but I, um, But they didn't begin eight minutes ago. They were actually created something like 100,000 years ago, because the fusion reaction that takes place is in the center of the sun. The sun is about a million miles across, and that's a huge reactor. Imagine uh, the equivalent of, of millions of, of fusion bombs going off every second. 
the light and the heat that's produced from those fusion reactions couldn't escape from the core of this dense object called the sun. Because of gravity? Because no, just because of the density of scattering in the plasma. So it's just like how it's just like how like light through water goes slightly slower than light through air. So this is like super thick water. It's more like when you're in Grand Central at rush hour and you're trying to get, you know, to the, to your track uh, to catch a subway and you just can't get out. Like you're just jostling and you're being bounced around. And there's something called a drunkard's walk or a random walk where you move in this, uh, you know, kind of ex- dim- diminishing returns kind of uh, pattern where it takes you a right, very long time to travel a very short distance. And that's what happens in the sun and it happened in the universe as well. And so we're just seeing the after effects of actually the light itself was produced at the basically in the first three minutes of the universe's history. Um, and that was the byproduct, the leftover heat from the formation of the fusion of elements that make up the lightest uh, elements on the periodic table. But Brian, so I'm curious. So you 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 saw this cosmic dust, but couldn't you just say, okay, that's cosmic dust. Let's keep looking and and figure out a way to distinguish between the dust and and gravitational waves. Like, are, were you still able to keep looking and, and find gravitational waves from before this plasma? No. So existed? then then we would have won the Nobel Prize, or we would. But see, we are doing that with the new upgraded version of Bicep. So this is Bicep. I created Bicep One. The experiment that made the announcement is called BICEP2. There's since been a BICEP3, and now there's a BICEP array, not a BICEP4. Uh, and then we're also building the Simons Array and the Simons Observatory in the Atacama Desert of Chile because it won't be believed if the BICEP team, imagine like, you know, we they discover, and I'm not part of their team again. Um, I've, I've been, I've left the team uh, fr- on friendly terms with the leadership that, that, you know, for a while I wasn't so friendly with it, if you re- remember my first book, but we become, you know, kind of hugged it out, as I say. And since then, we've we've really um, gone in different approaches to do the same thing, to measure both dust and the cosmic signals that could harbor the imprimatur of inflation. So you're absolutely right. What we'd measure, see, the light that we get doesn't come with a little, little label that says, I came from dust or I came from the cosmic microwave background. You just get the combination of the light from the cosmos plus the light from the dust. And then it's your job to make as many sensitive, careful, precise measurements to disentangle the amount that is attributable to dust. We know there's going to be dust-produced light, and we don't know that there's gravitational wave light there because the level of dust is already uh, is, is quite large, and we have to also contend with the intrinsic noise of the instrument. So we're actually winning this fight and we're getting ever more tightly constrained on how much inflation could have taken place if inflation took place, but it's a very long slog and it's going to take, you know, the better part of the next five years before we have a definitive answer of either we detect it or we don't have, we realize we don't have the sensitivity amidst the dust and amidst the intrinsic noise of the instrument itself. Every instrument has noise associated with it. So, so when's BICEP2 or BICEP Array, or, or when it, when's your next telescope going to launch so we could finally see the Big Bang in its full glory and you could win uh, the Nobel Prize? Yeah, right. So, you know, I've kind of given up on the Nobel Prize, to be honest with you. I did win a medal from my alma mater from Brown University called the Horace Mann Medal. And I, I yeah, think that doesn't count. I thanked them, but I said, now I can't write that book, you know, losing the Horace Mann Medal. Yeah. You know, so I've kind of gotten over the Nobel. I've now interviewed 13 Nobel Prize winners on my podcast. They're regular guys like you and me, James. You know, they put on their pants, two legs at a time, jumping through the air like we do. Um, so oh, well, I, well, I don't, do, I never change my pants. So that's <laughs> your pajamas. I just sleep in them. Yeah. You've got I, the, I uh, figured out a way around that, that cliche saying, You've got that uh, Netherlands Comedy Club uh, February 2020 pajama combo on from Since your, COVID, the last yeah. time you left the indoor environment. So, right. So we have telescopes that are deploying currently, and we're also building up a an observatory to measure the uh, the dust to unprecedented levels and also measure the signal. So, for example, you're driving at night. You're not driving, thank God. But say Robin's driving you <laughs> yeah. somewhere or whatever. Jay, won't let me drive. Jay's driving you somewhere. And, uh, and you know you have dust on your windshield, and you don't know how much there is. So how would you remove it? Well, you'd have to do a, quote, experiment. You'd look at it, 
and then you'd figure out some way to remove it. Oh, there's a button that sprays some juice on the windshield, and then the windshield wipers would remove it. There'd still be a little bit of dust left, right? You couldn't remove it perfectly, every single grain, but you could remove it below the level of what is causing an impediment to seeing straight ahead. So that's kind of what we're doing. We're building a very exquisite dust detection system and a very exquisite detector of this gravitational wave signal. So what do you think? Do you think that they're going to see the Big Bang? I mean, it seems like there's going to be another problem because it seems almost too good to be true to actually see the Big Bang. Well, you know, that's never stopped, you know, scientists from going after and looking. Again, what Galileo has said is measure what you can measure. So we're measuring, we know what exists, there's dust, and there could be this cosmic signal. But you're right, there, there is no proof of it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be searching for it. Now, some discoveries come serendipitously. Uh, by accident, by divine providence, in a sense. When you look out, uh, when astronomers in New Jersey, uh, where James grew up, uh, is uh, l looked out, uh, they were looking for the very first telecommunication signals from the very first satellites launched in the early 1960s. They were named Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. They looked up, they couldn't see the satellites with the signal-to-noise ratio that they expected because there was this hiss of microwave energy coming in all directions they couldn't get rid of. That, in turn, led to them discovering the cosmic microwave background and winning the Nobel Prize And 13 years later um, for discovering this signal. That was serendipitous. When the Higgs boson was discovered, people were looking for it. They expected to find it. They built a 13 billion euro experiment just to look for it, more or less. Um, and that experiment found what they were looking for. So there's two types of scientific discoveries that take place, one where you expect it, one where you don't. And in this case, you know, we have reason to be very cautious that if we do see something, it will really be, at first blush, the golden signal that we are, you know, uh, looking for. I would say it's, it's, it's safe to say that. But uh, you also have to look to rule it out and be, and be as equally dispassionate about disconfirming and not proving the, uh, the theory that, you know, many people have staked such high importance upon. Well, okay. It's good to hear, get a summary. Maybe you will win the Nobel Prize. That's what, I'm, I'm rooting for you, Brian, to win the Nobel Prize after all of this. So I don't know. You know, when you think about, like, what is the Nobel Prize? So, like, I've talked to so many people who have won it, and, of course, it, like, changes your life and, and does all sorts of things. Sure. But all the people that didn't win it and all the people that do win it that do nothing afterwards or— It's like any prize. It's, it's, it is what you make of it. Right? Like, I told our mutual friend, Ryan Holiday, you know, I found out about this, this award that I won and, and I've won a couple of nice awards lately. Um, one I, you know, only one I can talk about. I've, I've been notified I've won this really prestigious thing that's going to be announced in November. MacArthur um, Genius Award? Uh, no, no, not that one. Uh, this is something really uh, obscure, but, but it's important to me. Uh, but it's not public yet. I'll, you'll be the second person to know. I won't even tell my wife. I'll just tell James. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, and I wrote to Ryan Holiday because, you know, he and I have been, you know, kind of email buddies. I've had him on my show a few times. And I, I think you might have introduced us or you maybe surreptitiously, serendipitously. But anyway, I told him when I won it that he should be proud because he's kind of like my uh, stoic rabbi. And I said, you know, when I won one of these awards, I was just like, that's great. But if I didn't win it, I wouldn't have been like, oh, crap, I didn't win the freaking award. The way I might have been earlier in my life. And I think it's part of just getting mature that you just, you know, it doesn't mean uh, you, you shouldn't be guided by wanting to win these prizes and awards. And I freely admit I was early in my career. I wanted to outdo my father, who was an incredible scientist, but he never won the Nobel Prize. I wanted to, you know, it's like a rivalry with him. And it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like just having like a grandmaster rating. Like you almost don't have to play people like you're not going to play like my kids. Uh, who were playing this morning in, in anticipation of me, uh, you know, coming to you. And I've, I've now helped them, like, you know, checkmate each other twice in the same game. It's really kind of fun. <laughs> but, you know, when you get to that level, you almost don't have to, like, think about it anymore um, if you're not professional. Really. Well, well so, also, different things become important to you at different times. It could be the case that now, look, you, had a, you were single-minded pursuing this goal, not necessarily the Nobel Prize, but this scientific research. Yeah. And now you're pursuing scientific research. You're a podcaster. You're a writer. We're going to talk about your audio book you just did about Galileo. Mm -hmm. Like you have many interests and many passions that you pursue. And, and it could be the case that any one goal, like you've diversified your outcomes. <laughs> and so any one outcome, although it's still important to you, becomes less important doesn't mean you're not going to pursue them, but it means you're not going to be as emotionally tied because you're succeeding on these other things. 
Right. Yeah, it's, yeah, diversifying your interests and family and, and everything else. But I guess, you know, mostly it's it's realizing that you really don't take anything with you. It's it's kind of like this notion, David Brooks wrote about this in a in a book called The Road to Character, um, where he talks about the two different interpretations in the in the Torah and the Old Testament and the Bible, whatever you want to call it. There's like the, the Torah, the, the Bible discusses Adam, <clears throat> the first man, and it discusses him and it, and it does everything twice. And like the first time it's like, you know, he worked the land and he tilled the fields and he, and he had, uh, you know, horses and, and, or cat, you know, livestock. And then the other type of description for Adam, he's described again, almost identically, except that now he doesn't do those things. Instead he communed with God and he, and he was a spiritual being and a rabbi, Soloveitchik, I believe it is, uh, David Brooks quotes from, and he talks about these two Adams. He calls one of them the kind of resume Adam and the other one the epitaph or, you know, uh, uh, eulogy Adam. In other words, mm. some things you put on your resume, like I'm good at working the land and, and doing those crops. And the other one, I'm really good at those elevation offerings that bring the spices of aroma to the temple. You know, it's like two different, total different character aspects. And one of which, you know, like you went to Carnegie Mellon, like, is that going to be on your tombstone, like at your eulogy? Or is it going to be not. like father, husband, friend, you know, podcaster in a, you know, even you won't even put it like I got this medal from Brown and it's hugely prestigious. The guy who won it last year did win the Nobel Prize this year in economics, uh, Guido Imbens. Uh, and he's, you know, so it's for alumni of the graduate school where I got my PhD. And, uh, you know, and yet I do think the Nobel Prize is unique because people do put that on their <laughs> on their gravestones and it does get mentioned in their eulogies. And sometimes it gets mentioned in your eulogy if you didn't win a Nobel Prize. Like in the New York Times, like he was snubbed for a Nobel Prize, you know, or she was snubbed. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's unique in that sense. So I think it's, well, you know, sui generis is, is something in a, in a different category. But um, but yeah, I mean, more and more it's about doing the work and enjoying the process and being mindful of, you know, who comes next in, in the line of, of, of scientists that I get to mentor. And, you know, nowadays I get like a lot of thrill when one of my former graduate students becomes a professor and then they get a graduate student and then they graduate that. No, I mean, it's like, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot, one way you measure the success of a good professor, a good scientist is how many of their students become great scientists and professors. Yeah. So yeah. that's an exciting thing. Yeah, you don't get to get buried with your uh, with your you know kind of collection of papers and your citation count or or what what have you, but you do uh, kind of make this impact on on the network of people that you love and you take care of and and you support. And so yeah, that's become more of the motivation and the the science is a vehicle to do that that is fun and I get in the flow state from doing it because it's just so delightful. The problem that I'm having now, James, like I'm on like the other. Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm on six different Zoom calls. <laughs> Why is they're that? not like, yeah, I mean, well, it's like the, there's one about the site in Chile. There's one about the operations of the whole project. There's another debrief for the managers of that project. Then there's, um, you know, a meeting. I have a meeting with my students and my postdocs and my college, you know, so it's like just nonstop either. In, now we're back to in person, but this this past quarter I was teaching cosmology wearing a mask of all things, which is do you still familiar. Do you still enjoy teaching as much? I actually enjoy teaching more after COVID. It's Undergrads or grad students? I do both. So one-on-one, uh, -on -one it's graduate students. And then in a class, I have, you know, 45, 50 students. And, um, you know, COVID I taught last year, it was only on Zoom. This year it was in person after, and I didn't teach like three years ago because I think I was on paternity leave or, or something like that. I forget. And um, because of that, uh, you know, it was really my first time teaching in person in three years. And so I realized how much I missed it. And I realized I'm going to try to win, you know, like the hearts and minds of the students by doing something they'd never seen before, which is to do experiments, cosmology experiments <laughs> in the, in the classroom. So no one had ever done this as long as far as I know. Uh, and I wasn't like building new universes, but like right behind me, you can't see it if you're listening, obviously, but you know, I have a, I have a, a cloud chamber which detects subatomic particles traveling near the speed of light. Uh, I had a Geiger counter to, to talk about the formation of the lightest elements. I have like heavy water, which is produced very rarely in uh, reactions other than in the Big Bang. Uh, we talked about that and then it's proper spectroscopy, telescopes, looking at redshift with the Doppler shift. I brought in all these props and it was so much fun. 
uh, and, and Bunsen burners, like blowing up balloons and thermodynamics. And, and I was just like, I'm just going to do everything that I love to do that I'm going to use my secret weapon, my unfair advantage is that I'm an experimental cosmologist. So I'm not a theorist. I'm not good enough, smart enough, whatever you want to say to do all the equations. I understand the equations, but I don't create them. But what I do create are new experiments and new interpretations and new analyses. When, when you were a kid, did you like to tinker and oh, take yeah. things apart and build and things? One of my kids is like, he, you know, your mom or dad ever tell you, like, I hope you have a kid like you someday. Um, <laughs> I have a couple of kids like me. <laughs> and it's great. But it's like, I realize how it could be frustrating to a non-scientist. Like my mother is not a scientist. But, um, you know, to see them, like, they get, like, this this chalk, like they call it railroad chalk. It's like this huge um, cylinder of chalk. And then he like grinds it up into like the finest possible talcum powder. And then he mixes it in water. It becomes like like mortar, except it's like bright orange. And he's like mixing it. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm doing experiments. I'm doing experiments. And I'm How like, I love it. He's four. Um, and, uh, and I love it. And my other sons are looking at like, well, how could we make, you know, a portable nuclear device that could fly <laughs> on a drone? And I'm just like, stop right there. You know, let's, let's write it down. There, and so there. actually with one of my kids, I go on a walk with him and we, uh, we talk about, you know, his ideas and I just have him record it. You know, now everything is audio and yeah. we just record it. And I'm like, someday it'll be, you know, you'll have your own podcast <laughs> into the impossible too. And, and uh, you'll take over the family business such as it is. And, yeah. you know, the, the people say that a lot. They say, you know, scientists are like children. You know, they're inquisitive, they're curious, they're imaginative, they're playful. And I always say, yeah, and they're also jealous, they're petty, they don't share their toys with their uh, you know, siblings. And, you know, so everything is a double-edged sword. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured, 
for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll sign up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. I do agree with you that scientists are very playful. Like I've had a lot of scientists on the podcast, as you know, yeah. uh, you well, most of all, but also mm -hmm. many of your colleagues, mm -hmm. Car Carlo Ravelli, who we'll talk about in a second, Alan Bobby Lightman, Loeb. Bobby Loeb, Avi Loeb uh, 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 you know, Alan Lightman, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 what's the guy? Uh, Oh, now I'm forgetting the guy, Mich Michio Keiko. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. He, and they're all very like childlike and very yeah. and they and they science is a very poetic, beautiful thing for for all By the these way, people. Every single you. one of those people that you pointed mm -hmm. out is a theoretical, a physicist or a cosmologist. So amongst, I think those, it's more fun to be theoretical because then you could say, well, how? What if I could teleport? Well, then this must be happening. That's <laughs> like right. you're allowed, you're allowed to think like science fiction thoughts. But a lot of it is total nonsense and can never be verified. And so, someone like me who likes working on things that you get an outcome for, I always tell my students, and that's what I try to do on my YouTube channel. What I what I pivoted from, I used to do only interviews with with scientists, Nobel Prize winners. We've had on 13 Nobel Prize winners. I just interviewed in preparation. This will come out after Father's Day. But for Father's Day, I interviewed Richard Powers, who won the Pulitzer Prize for The Overstory, this very f thick, famous book. Just a wonderful guy. His newest book is about astrobiology, and it's about fathers and sons. I really want to introduce you to him because he'd be okay. – you'd love this guy. I mean, he's a brilliant writer, and he's just like this avuncular figure. And um, and I've had on all these great, and I still do those interviews. You can still find them on my YouTube channel and I'm on podcast. But I also started doing like 10 minute long science explanation videos, but only talking about like cool new experiments that disprove like outrageous theoretical claims. Like we're being visited by aliens or we're, you know, we've discovered a fifth force. Or we, so it's like my job, I feel like now is to be um, not in a curmudgeonly way, but just show people how much hype there is in scientific uh, claims and, and highlight the fact that 90% of what you hear at first, we've seen aliens, we've, the, you know, it's cold fusion, we've done this and that, they turn out to be wrong. But the challenge is the announcement of, you know, Chinese scientists find evidence for aliens, that occurs on page one of CNN. And then the retraction, if it ever comes, comes out, you know, on the Sunday, yeah. Saturday edition that nobody reads in page B24 or something. No, no, I, I agree. Like, and this is, this is the problem with quote unquote science is that anything, anything that any scientist mentions is considered by 97 or 98% of the population as fact. Once a scientist says that it's fact, but throughout history, and, and we're going to talk about Galileo who was confronted with this most of all throughout history, a scientist actually usually says the things that aren't considered fact and only later are considered fact, usually because that scientist, you know, did the work and the research to, to start to, you know, and in other areas, not just in physics, you have to always consider what's the agenda of the scientist. And now people are going to think I'm about to start talking about big farm or whatever, but I'm talking about artificial intelligence. Right. The phrase artificial intelligence yes. is bullshit. It's complete BS. There is no such thing as artificial intelligence. But, but in the 1950s, when the phrase originated, it was a great phrase to use if you wanted to raise money from the Department of Defense, which That's is where right. all these computer scientists raise their money. And now you have this Google guy who I don't know if he's a computer scientist or not. He doesn't seem to me to be like one, but you have this Google guy who says, oh, this AI created by Google is, is alive. When mm. clearly just looking at his, the quotes, it clearly is not. And oh, B, it, yeah. it shows a basic non under like AI is like another way to put AI. Like if you want to call it something is advanced statistics. And that's mm -hmm. all it really is. Neural networks are an advanced kind of statistics. It's a very almost, yeah. you know, statistics, machine it's, learning. It's yeah. like statistics, 
401, not even yeah. graduate level, like, but like senior level. Right. And no, that's 100%. all AI is right now. So, yeah. the, the, and, right. and by the way, there's only been maybe one innovation in AI in the past 30 or 40 years. And that's the innovations that created uh, grinder. <laughs> well, maybe it's using that, but like, uh, like deep mind had some mm -hmm. innovations with, you know, kind of, um, these special types of, you know, adverse neural networks that would fight each other. Yeah. And, um, but even the word neural network, it doesn't, it doesn't work like a brain. It's just, they call it neural networks because they think it, the original guys, Marvin Minsky, there was an analogy to a brain, but that's the best case. Right. But yeah, let's, you've done an audio book on Galileo. Yes. And I want to talk about that. Like this has been as long as I've known you, which is years now. <laughs> yeah. As long as I've known you, you've been obsessed with Galileo. And, and by the way, not just you, other lesser known scientists like Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein also consider Galileo mm -hmm. the father of modern science. Yep. But you took the extra step that Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking were not qualified to do, which is you basically made an audio book of his writings you've done this phenomenal job at it. And I want to talk about why and, and what you learned from the father of modern yeah. science, what you learned, not just what you expected, but what you learned. Yeah. So, uh, and this is where, you know, we, we, we have to, we would be remiss if I didn't credit you with two different things. One is giving me permission, legal authority vested in you as my podcast mentor. I am a, a, a certified lawyer on Twitter. That's right. You are. And you're an expert in international diplomacy, vaccines and virology. Uh, yes. You had told me, because so what I did is I had done um, an interview with this channel that, you know, probably half of your listeners will now turn off the podcast called Prager University. And they have this thing called Book Club. And uh, it's a very controversial guy named Michael Knowles, who is that. Uh, By the way, I don't know this. Like, is Prager University some kind of like conservative? Oh, it's outlet, definitely or? highly conservative. Yeah. And I've done multiple videos for them, but I'm never political. It's always talking about yeah. what science can and can't do. I've never heard you do anything political on any of these yeah, things. Nah, it's, it, politics doesn't interest me. I mean, you know, there's an old joke Einstein dies. And uh, he's dead and then goes to heaven and every guy he meets that's really funny. Or, or girl he meets. Yeah. It's a ripper on fun time. He meets, he asks, what's your IQ? So he meets the first woman comes up. What's your IQ? She says 150. Great. We can talk about math, theoretical physics and, uh, and all sorts of other things. Uh, next person he meets, you know, uh, what's your IQ? 120. Oh, great. We can talk about law. We can talk about, um, you know, the constitution, you know, whatever. Um, uh, then the, uh, then the next person he meets, uh, what's your IQ? That's a hundred. Oh, we can talk about the stock market. Uh, we can talk about, uh, you know, uh, all, all sorts of things like that. Then he meets someone, what's your IQ? 91. Oh, we can talk about politics. So it's, <laughs> it's really, it's not interesting to a scientist because it's so local. I mean, I talked to this guy, Justin Amash, who's a libertarian on Twitter. He has a podcast, uh, that's really fun. And we, you know, we, we did compare notes about how politics and science are related and interdependent on each other. He's a, he's a good guy to have on your show as well, by the way. Um, yeah. but anyway, you had told me a long time ago when I was getting prepared for this interview and they asked me to speak about a science book. So they never had a science book, which is why I love talking to these conservative Christians mainly. Um, you know, I get to talk to 3 million, you know, people that will never think about the scientific method or think about Galileo. They said, which book do you want to talk about? It could be any science book, Einstein. And I was like, no, nah, it's too impenetrable. Isaac Newton, completely opaque. Uh, but Galileo, I said, is a, one of the best writers who ever lived, not only science writers, but just like overall as a writer, just poetic, beautiful. But, you know, nowadays, thanks to, you know, uh, being influenced by you so much, uh, I only want to consume things using, you know, Audible's 3X, you know, feature. So I was like, well, how can I possibly do this? And, you know, I want to go and listen to the audio book because it's a 450 page long book. Uh, and I'd never read the whole book. So, um, so I said, look, I'm going to go and download from Audible the audiobook. Oh, it doesn't exist. In fact, none of his books exist in audio format, which is weird. None of Einstein's books exist in audio format. None of any of these guys, Darwin's books exist in audio format. <laughs> so you, I'm should like, just, you should just make all of them into audio books. Well, you gave me the original idea and now you're now the student, you know, has, as Leonardo da Vinci once said, he said, sad is the disciple who doesn't outdo the master. I agree so, with that. Yeah, I agree with that too. That's why Jay is to be watched and feared. Uh, but I, but I thought about, you know, well, should I just do it? And you were like, don't think about it, just do it. And yeah. I was like, ah, how do I do it? You know, you're like, he's not going to sue you. He's dead for 400 years. Uh, he has no estate and blah, blah, you know, and you started putting me down this pathway to do it. And then, and then all these dominoes started falling into place. And it turned out 
that one of my friends knew somebody who worked for the people that held the right. Now, Galileo is dead, and I can translate from Italian using Google Translate, but the definitive translation was translated by this man, Stillman Drake. And he has an estate, and he sold the rights to, happens to be, the University of California Press. <laughs> uh, and so serendipitously, I came in contact, and I was able to get the rights to that book. And then through your friends and producers, Nathan Roxburgh and Tim Bader and Friends of Jay, they set me up on this, on this pathway that I started a production company. So I actually have a production company. I recorded the first ever audiobook along with our friend Carlo Ravelli, who's written the, some of the most popular science yeah. books in history. As an Italian, this book called The Dialogue, it's actually a trialogue. It's a conversation between three friends over four days debating whether or not the Earth is the center of the universe. <laughs> so these were huge stakes back in the 1600s. And the ultimate outcome of the story is even the meta story is almost even more interesting because this is the book that got Galileo imprisoned for the remainder of his life, threatened with, with torture and death for recounting heresy. So let, let me ask the first question there. Yeah. Um, like if you're going to write, like, okay, I would admit if I'm going to write something where, well, I don't even know if this is true, but if I'm going to write something where at, at least I'm going to be threatened with death by the only government that existed at that time, which was essentially the church. If yeah. I'm going to write something that's going to cause me to potentially be killed, I probably wouldn't do it. Like, why did Galileo, and he even makes fun of the Pope in yeah. his writings. The name of the guy who espouses the Pope's logic is named Simplicio the Simpleton. He gives him the name the Simpleton. Yeah. So that, to me, speaks in another meta level. It speaks to the fact that we all know geniuses who are brilliant idiots. And they're just so smart and they're in domain experts, but they know nothing about life. And, and that to me, now Galileo actually did know a lot about life. Uh, he was a very complicated, very interesting figure, as was Einstein. Uh, both men, you know, had difficulties with women and illegitimate children and challenges. Uh, and Galileo certainly was not a stranger. to But he knew the controversy that he was stepping into, but he thought his brilliance could kind of act as an escape clause, that he had actually mentored the Pope Pope Urban, uh, as a young boy, uh, and had taught him many things about science. And the Pope was actually quite open to it. And, and he said, look, you can, you can study this uh, earth-centered, uh, sun-centered cosmology, but you can't teach it. And studying meant doing it in the vernacular of science of that time, which was Latin. So his first most famous, rather, book in the early times was called The Sidereus Nuncius, The Starry Messenger. And that's the book that really was the first demonstration of the scientific method, using a telescope to collect evidence about a hypothesis and then refine the hypothesis and test it. And that proved there were craters on the moon and that Jupiter had moons and Saturn had rings. You know, it was incredible. It's like having your own personal large hadron collider and nobody else could access it. And he never shared how he built the telescope and so forth. So the Pope was cool with that. Uh, but he said, make sure you don't teach it. And teaching meant doing it in Italian. And this book is called The Dialogo, which is not Latin. It's, it's Italian. And so he taught it. And, and of course, he did call the Pope the simpleton. And he did call himself the salvation, Salviati. And so Carlo plays Salviati in this book. My uh, close friend of 30 years now, Lucio Picciarillo, who's an Italian uh, uh, Brit who's living in Manchester, professor in Manchester. He did uh, Simplicio, the simpleton. And then I did this guy who's kind of like an intelligent lay person interlocutor. And his name is, uh, is, is Sagredo. And my job is kind of just to like intersperse between them. I, I didn't try to put on an Italian accent uh, or anything, but we, um, we had this wonderful, you know, kind of conversation over audio. It's 21 hours long. <laughs> And, uh, and it, uh, it, it, you know, luckily it takes less than four days to record it. But when you read this, James, you ask me like, what did I learn? Um, I still just feel like chills. Cause it's, it's like, um, I told my wife, I was like, it's like, I'm having a conversation with him, with Galileo. Like I'm talking to him or he's talking to me. Here's a passage, James. So, so he was, he was this incredible and Einstein calls this book, you know, the most important book, not just the most important science book, essentially in his foreword which I had Frank Wilczek, winner of the 2004 Nobel Prize, he narrated Einstein's foreword to this book. So you hear this Nobel Prize winner, you hear uh, Fabiola Giannotti, who runs the Large Hadron Collider collaboration. She narrates uh, the Galileo's preface, dedication to the Duke of Tuscany. It's just a magical experience. But here's Galileo, and he's talking as Salviati, 
and he's kind of hedging his bets, but um, but he does it with some level of humility. It's the very last kind of uh, paragraphs of the book, so I'm, you have to download the whole book. You can't just get it in the first chapter. Uh, I need this. My kids need to go to go to Disneyland this summer. Okay, so here it goes. Um, he says, I do not presume to be able to adduce all the proper and sufficient causes of those effects which are new to me and which consequently I have had no chance to think about. He's talking about discovering in his mind the proof that the sun is the center of the universe. He said, what I'm about to say, I propose merely as a key to open portals to a road never before trodden by anyone in a firm hope that minds more acute than mine will broaden this road and penetrate further along it than I have done in my first revealing of it. So question, is he saying it in, in such a way so he can later deny that he's actually saying the earth rotates around the sun? <laughs> yes. So at the end he goes, well, at uh, what point are you, the one who's accusing me of heresy, you're actually limiting God's power because God could make the universe appear any way he wants to. And so by you saying, no, it has to be this way. And, uh, and ultimately, it's very interesting because the Hebrew Bible, which they're basing this on, uh, the, the Catholic Church was basing the earth-centered cosmology on a passage from like Joshua and a couple of other places where the sun stands still. And it seems like the sun is going. And it does seem like the sun orbits around the earth, right? I mean, if I asked you, you know, prove to me that the uh, the earth goes around the sun and not the other way around, or you'll you'll be convicted of heresy. I mean, you couldn't do it. I know that you couldn't do it because even my graduate students can't do it half the time. I mean, I can't prove that, and I can't prove that the world is not flat. Yeah, and these are like, things we like, like things that I'm we take for granted, like are 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 actually harder than people think. <laughs> yeah. So what Galileo was doing is he was staking his claim to be the first discoverer of this phenomenon, first pr one to prove it using scientific methods. And also to have some, as you mentioned, plausible deniability that could save his arse if things came down to it, uh, also hoping his favor that he had curried with the Pope would save him. But ultimately, James was so fascinating about this, this book, which I've fallen in love with and will always have this special place in my heart, and also has unlocked other things, like we'll talk about another idea you gave me, which is to create NFTs. And I want to talk to you about that um, in our time. So what Galileo did was he, um, you know, in, in creating this, thi this, this proof, which he thought was a proof that the earth went around the sun, he actually came up with a confirmation bias uh, failure and blunder on his own, which is to say that he believed that the fact that the earth had tides, that every day there's two high tides and two low tides on the ocean, that that was proof that the earth was not only revolving around its axis once per day, like this bottle of water that I'm holding, but also orbiting around the sun, which is what he was trying to prove. So he assumed that that could only happen if the earth was in rotation and revolutionary um, uh, orbits around the sun and about its axis. That's totally wrong. We, we've known for, even Galileo suspected that he knew that was wrong. So he almost like he published something because he was so convinced that his other arguments about what we now call relativity and motion, that those were right, that he was willing to kind of risk it all on this much, much weaker and, in fact, incorrect evidence because it has nothing. To, the tides have nothing to do with the rotation of the Earth or motion of the Earth. They have to do everything with the moon's influence on the Earth's oceans. Uh, something See, that he could have. There's no. There's no way. There's no way. Like for instance, I would be able to figure out, or anybody, even though we all know that again as yeah. somewhat common knowledge. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I only like vaguely know that. Yeah. So. so you know, in this quest to kind of reveal Galileo's, um, you know, his impact. Uh, so I said, well, you know, how many books does this guy have? And he has like 14 books. Like he published and he perished, but he has many, many books, some of which lend themselves to the audio format more than others. But there's one book. It's actually one of the rarest of all his books. It's called The Military Compass. And, um, and it's... Uh, this was like his last book, maybe? I forget. No, no, this is one of his first books. So this is okay. published in 1600. Uh, 32 years before the dialogue. And um, the reason that's so important is not not really because it has so much interesting stuff in it. It's more because there's so few copies that remain of it. It's like more rare than the Gutenberg Bible um, in terms of uh, copies of the first edition of it. So what Galileo did with it is that he, um, he it's basically a compass is actually a slide rule. It's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a converter to do like logarithms or to take, um, to take uh, powers and do stuff like that. So it was actually a, a tool 
like a calculator, but obviously hundreds of years before we had calculators or even slide rolls. And in it, he, he talks about like, because he wants to sell these devices, he wants to sell the books rather than sell the devices because it's very expensive to make a slide rule compared to printing a book in this, even in 1600. So he wanted to sell as many books as possible. So he was really selling the instruction manual. It's like nowadays our phones don't even come with instruction manuals. But you imagine like buying the instruction manual to the iPhone. I mean, David Pogue used to write these books about it, uh, but missing manual and stuff. But anyway, so he wrote this book and in it, James, there's a, there's a, a chapter and it's called currency conversion. He talks about, imagine if you're, you know, forced with uh, converting um, Venetian ducats to, uh, to Florentine uh, scudi or whatever, and you want to do this conversion, uh, here's how you do it. And it's, it's basically just making a ratio between two numbers, right? But imagine like right now I said, uh, you know, Galileo, I can either drop on you like a hundred million lira or scudi or whatever, or ducats, or I can drop on you uh, and store a hundred of these copies of this first edition of this book. Which do you think would be more valuable in the year 2022? Like a piece of scudi papers, I mean, like some collector, you might get 10 bucks for it or something. Like that. These books are like priceless, literally priceless, because there's so few of them left. So if he had just provided <laughs> for his family and his and his uh, and the ancestor, he would have been, uh, that would have been the richest dynasty in the world. And yet the greatest mind of the, perhaps the entire history of the planet, uh, maybe Einstein accepting, didn't even think about that and was so concerned with in the moment, let me make a profit. It, it, it's, those are some of the things I learned from him and, and thinking about, but you know, that might be a good, uh, like, you know, it's one thing to think about posterity, but you're dead then and let your kids, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not saying being, be cruel to your kids, but let your kids deal with the same worries and issues that we've all had to deal with yeah. and, and learn struggle. And yep. so, and yeah, he needed the money. Probably the guy was, uh, you know, defending himself against the Pope who wanted to kill him. So, he <laughs> and he needed... had illegitimate daughters and, and son, yeah, he had to provide for, for a lot. So, mm. uh, so along yeah. that theme, I started to think about like, well, what are what is a first edition? Like, what does it mean to have a first edition of a book like this? And I started to think about, um, you know, well, what, what could we actually do with it to preserve, but also to protect these artifacts. So what is it like? And you were like, oh, it sounds like an NFT. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So maybe what I could do is, you know, kind of, first of all, develop a legacy or develop a community around his ideas, but also to produce things of scientific interest. And I've been interested in like, how can we use crypto or NFTs or whatever, not to get rich, because, you know, you know how much Einstein was worth when he died, James? No. $65,000. Okay, but... But he was well provided for by the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton. Yeah, oh, he wasn't poor. Like Charlie he would Towns. never, he would never go broke. For instance, right? Uh, William Shockley invented the transistor that we're talking using right now and listening to on your iPod or uh, iPod that don't exist anymore on your iPhone or your uh, Google Android. Those people died, you know, middle class. In other words, scientists are awful at monetizing. And even like Nobel, you know how many Nobel Prize uh, economists are millionaires? How many? Almost none. I mean, the ones that like maybe Krugman it might be or somebody. Very I few. Think, well, again, like professors don't make a lot of money. Right. No, no, that's true. But I'm, I'm just saying. So, but A, that's a shame in a certain sense that you develop something like the laser, the transistor, the internet was developed by physicists. And physics in as a whole has to grovel for little crumbs of the budget, right? So we just spent you know, twice NASA's budget to the Ukraine. I'm not going to talk about like, is that good or bad? And that's like for a month of work, right? Twice NASA's budget. If you ask the ordinary person, how much of your taxes go to NASA? They think like 50% because it has such a huge impact or SpaceX or whatever. It has a, such a huge, huge impact on our daily curiosity and the mystery of life. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where, where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth 
I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We wanna care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity and I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Here's my mission, James. I want to fund, you know, cadres of postdocs and graduate students. I want to fund the biggest telescopes on earth without having to grovel and have an 8% at best acceptance rate for my proposals by the National Science Foundation. This is the key for anything. Like, this is related to the asking for permission. Because yeah. asking for money is a similar way of asking for permission. And yes, there are some projects where you know, they're big enough. You have to ask for money. You have to, you have to do all the things you need to do to fundraise and grant raise and so on. But the ideal state of things is to figure out 
some way in which people are asking you. You That's want right. people to come to you and say, listen, can you do this? Here's the money. I mean, like Elon Musk doesn't have to ask anybody, but like not everyone's Elon Musk, but it right. would be great. And I always tell people when it comes to like, for instance, raising money or selling a company, much better than raising money is somebody approaching you and saying, hey, can you take my money? I want to give you money. Right, right. Like otherwise you're just, <laughs> you're selling something and you're not, it doesn't feel as good somehow. Yeah, no, you're a hundred percent right. So, so first of all, and I don't expect to finish it. Maybe we can do a part two at some point, but so then I started talking to people about like these things called DAOs, you know, digital autonomous, uh, autonomous or, or organizations or something like that. I'm sure I'm not getting it. Wait, well, what, what's your goal here? You want, you want a community that revolves around what? Well, so there's, there's multiple aspects. My ultimate goal is for science to be independent of the whims of a two-year budget cycle in Congress. Uh, in America. And I only care about America. I'm sorry, I care about the world, but I care about what I can have an impact on, which is mostly American students that I'm paid to teach and to train and the American public who pay my salary, right? So I'm going to be selfish. Just think about America. I want American science to always be at the top. And it's slipping, James. Our, our, we're losing dominance. We, have, we no longer have the biggest telescopes on earth. Um, we no longer have the, uh, the largest particle accelerators on earth. We no longer have our space agency fully capable of launching astronauts into space without other countries or uh, entities like SpaceX. So uh, I, I want, I'm a product of, you know, public education. I teach at a public school. So anyway, that's my priority. I want to fund science in perpetuity. I want some kind of endowment for science. And uh, maybe that endowment, well, the DAO part will be this DAO type uh, entity. Mm, that's like one that. goal. Endowment, yeah. Yeah. So another, yeah, that's trademarked already. I, I trademarked it. Um the other thing is I also want to protect these books. So I want to have a, a combined project where, you know, you buy a, a, you know, Gallo coin or Galileo coin or whatever, and you get access to this community. You get all my lectures about Galileo. You get all my audiobooks, and videos, and, so, and uh, you get to meet with me and other luminaries like Mario Livio and, and, and Carlo Ravelli and Avi Loeb and Eric Weinstein, you know, all these great scientists that I'm so blessed to have had on my show, and Michio Kaku, Frank Wilczek, put them all together and, um, and have some way of raising funds to buy these books. Because right now, there's very few of them left. Every day, you, they lose one or they, you know, something happens to one. And I don't want it to be like the Gutenberg Bible. The last one sold to Sony Corporation heirs and, and is locked in some basement in Tokyo uh, $50 million so, worth in 1986. I, so, these are to be enjoyed and, and savored. Okay, so... So let's start with that for a second, because that actually has value. So these books, like Galileo's books, for instance, what are they worth right now altogether? So, so this book, The Dialogue, if you buy a first edition, which is all I care about, is about between one hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000. The, the compass is almost priced. You almost can't buy it, but, but maybe a million dollars. Same thing is true of, by the way, some of the more recent books, like uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, the first edition of it, is more rare than Galileo's dialogue, which is 200 years so, older. So, so here's, here's how you can do this. So mm -hmm. you basically, you basically create a cryptocurrency that behaves like a hedge fund. So if I own, let's say, let's say there's a million coins, um, the coins you, you're going to, in the initial, initial coin offering, you're going to raise, let's say a hundred million dollars. You're going to sell each one of these million coins for a hundred dollars. And now with the hundred million dollars, it's, you're going to immediately buy, um, you know, all the science, a hundred million dollars in today's prices of all the, you know, legendary scientific masterpieces mm -hmm. you could think of. Yep. And now every coin represents one, one millionth of that asset. You're going to tokenize almost like an IPO, but you're going to tokenize all of these legendary masterpieces. Yeah. Like the guys wanted to do with the, with the constitution a couple months back. Right. They yeah. To... Yeah. So, so. And then people buy and sell the coins based on how they think the value of these masterpieces are going up or down. So like in a recession, maybe they go up because you, you want to buy collectibles and in inflation, they go up because uh, you want to buy collectibles when in an inflationary period. And, you know, I don't know when they would go down. Maybe if, I don't know if Galileo. They've only gone me up. Too. I mean, they might not go up so fast, but like you can't afford these on a. On a <laughs> right. And then how, them, right? how will the coins um, ever, you know, show actual cash value? Well, if you potentially, you know, the, 
if you if you if you call this a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, then the owners of the coins can vote and decide we're going to sell Darwin's or the first edition Darwin's Origin of Species. So we're going to sell one and and distribute the proceeds to the mm -hmm. holders of the coin. And at some point, if there's a big inflationary period, and now people think there's going to be a deflationary period, maybe the 51% of the DAO will say, okay, let's sell all of them, and and then just all the cash proceeds get distributed. Yeah for the Galileo coin. And that's how, that's how you could do it. It's a very simple actual, yeah. it's almost like a hedge fund so structure. I did um, a simple, I did a simple proof of concept. So I took um, my friend Jay Pasikoff at, at Williams College, is a renowned scientist. He actually endorsed my first book and, um, <clears throat> and he actually owns a copy of both all these books by Galileo, which he's donated to Williams College, their library for protection. And <laughs> he doesn't keep them in his, underneath his bed, right? Um, about a million dollar collection. So when my first book came out, I took images of that high quality, high resolution images, and uh, I started to convert them into NFTs. And this is, you, you encouraged me to do that. So I did one, I sold it for half an ETH or, or something on my website. So if you go wow. to briankeating.com slash dialogue, dialogue um, you'll get, uh, you can see, you could buy now, uh, uh, the, uh, the cover illustration is this classic illustration of, of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and conversation about the world and stuff. That one's on sale for five ETH, which as of today is gone. It's it's worth, you know, one third of what it was worth last week when I minted it. Uh, but I'm just playing around with it. I'm trying to have fun with it. That, you know, is not part of the endowment. That's just like seeing if there's an interest in this proof of concept. But if there is, and I, there's 51 images in this book, you know, if you sold each one for, you know, a couple ETH and they go up, um, then, yeah, then you could buy a copy of the dialogue, which I wouldn't own. That I would put in some structure. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, right? So I don't have a lot of time to deal with things like that. But I'm interested in getting help from from the audience, your audience and mine, um, to promote this. Eventually, so I think it's easier to scale the the custodying of the great books of history that made the biggest impact on science. And there's, there's you know, I have a lot of expertise learning about these books, but there are people that know much more than me and I could involve them. Um, but the ultimate goal, again, so then I want to use those proceeds to kind of crowdsource or outsource science. But I, I have to, we'll have to do this another, you know, a, a different time, James. But here's what the thing for my notepad ideas that I'm looking at. What would you, like, what could you turn into an NFT that, by the way, wouldn't like, like the first image from the Webb Space Telescope, like, that's pretty valuable. Now, of course, the U.S. government paid well, for that. Let, let, I want to I wanna look at NFTs in a different way. You're saying, let's take something and make it special and wrap an NFT around it. And then people yeah. can say they own this special thing. But think of NFTs instead as tickets, as, yeah. as an NFT. When you own an NFT, you have access to something and no one could forge that access. Only you have that access because the NFT is on the blockchain. It can't be forged. It can't be fraudulent. Um, only yep. you, if you own that NFT, you have access to the thing that this NFT protects. Now, NFTs kind of started as protecting, you know, digital assets like Jack Dorsey's, a pic, an image of Jack Dorsey's first tweet, for instance. But right. that might be bullshit. We don't know if that really right. has value or not. So what can you offer? Maybe it's an access to a community of, uh, special scientists that are working on some special project or, or working on other ideas or, or, or you can provide access to some parts of Galileo's, uh, you know, books that have never been released before or your interpretation of this, that's never been released before, but what can you provide access to that has some value mm. that people would want access to? So for instance, um, if Warren Buffett sold as an NFT, you could have lunch with me. That's a valuable NFT. People would want to buy that NFT. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and people have auctioned, people have put a place of value on lunch with him. It's like a million dollars or something. Right. So, so, oh, yeah. so yeah. So, so what can you provide? What, what can you think of that you can, you can deliver access to and wrap that into an NFT? I think it's, you know, it's kind of like master classes. It's, it's, you know, um, personal kind of events with great scientists, great authors, great luminaries, thinkers, uh, you know, I don't think like if you were looking at the data coming out of bicep, you'd be like, all right, yeah. So like the raw data, stuff like that, it's not particularly interesting. I would do things like meteorites and telescopes. I mean, there could be really big, you know, we have like very expensive, but very good, you know, very high quality samples. I'm shaking my meteorites now. So by the way, if you uh, listeners of the James Altucher podcast, the special offer right now, the first hundred people of the podcast that go to briankeating.com 
slash list, I'm going to send a piece of space dust. So uh, you have to live in America. It's the first hundred people, come, you know, first come, first serve. Brian, but I'm sa- Brian serving. BrianKeating.com slash space dust. Space, uh, no, slash so list. Just list, list, the mailing list. Or BrianKeating.com okay. will get you there too. You have to live in the U.S. because I'm mailing it just U.S. Post Service. I'm a humble servant of the public. Uh, but I'm sending some residue, some powder of this meteorite that landed – Four billion years ago, uh, was created four billion years ago, and the solar system was created. So that's the ultimate NFT. Um, these, these, you know, you can't. Every meteorite's unique, and I'm going to send a little tiny fragment of a, you know, so basically it looks like iron dust powder. But I'm going to send information about it. Where was it found? How old yeah, see, is it? What's see, it made of? And I'm going to send that to all hundred of your listeners who get, you know, to the mailing list first. So, so, so by the way, why don't you say, okay, you're going to make, you're going to call it the Galileo Club, and mm-hmm. um, when you buy an NFT, you get. You're allowed to go into the Galileo Club, which, you know, maybe they get, they get to talk with you. They get to talk with Eric Weinstein. They get to talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, whoever. And they also get access to not only this community, but they get access to uh, one of these pieces of space dust. Yeah, and telescopes. Because a lot of times people come up to me, I want to get a telescope. And I've told you it's a, it's a crime against humanity for any parent not to get their kid a $50 telescope from Amazon even. But that made me think, what would James say? What would you tell me, James, if I said there's some, you know, crappy telescope on Amazon, they should just get it? Because you can see everything Galileo saw, you can see the moons, you can see galaxies, you can see nebula. What would you tell me? What's James' advice to Brian in that situation? There's no good telescope, quality telescope that's affordable for parents to get their kids. What would you say? Well, I mean, I don't really know. I would say just get any telescope. No, you would tell me to make one myself. I... I don't know. It depends if you have that skill set. <laughs> do like, I, I don't have make... a skill set to make a gal? So, see, make see, gal- because, so here's what because I would Because the, would... the other type of advice is like people, this is very important actually, people in nickel and dime their own lives. It's one thing to be conscious of cost. Like don't spend $20 for something that could, should cost you $10 in the next aisle over. But I'm not going to, if I'm interested in what I can see in a telescope, but I don't know how to make a telescope, I'm just going to buy a shitty telescope and look at it. And I'm not going to say, oh, it's $60. I should save that money. No, I could, uh, if $60 causes me to like just ruin my life and become homeless, then I'm in trouble. So, so like, like books, I never, I, I make it a rule. If I think even for a second that I want some book, I just buy the book. Mm-hmm. So I don't, yeah, so I no, don't I agree. Write it. I, but here's, so I, I'm saying as part of the benefit of being in the Galileo club, you would get one of these telescopes, either one that I would make, but but really, uh, I have very advanced uh, telescopes made by colleagues of mine that are pub- that have a GPS and can do everything. So you have to point and shoot telescopes, automatic, and they could t- stream to Instagram. They could do all this cool stuff, but they're several thousand dollars. And so, yeah, you'd have to buy several pages of the, uh, you know, sponsor several pages of the purchase. The last thing I want to leave you with is, you know, one is none, as they say in the military, right? Your friend Jocko who's never come on my podcast, even though I've talked to him and he's, his people have asked me to host his buddies on my podcast. Jocko, if you're listening, I love you. I'm like 10 miles away from you. We've, we've hung out in person. I didn't give you the black eye that we Just show up at his house. Just show up. No, he's going to freaking roll me. I don't want to do that. No, James. he won't. Live and be well. No, no extreme ownership. He, he will appreciate that. <laughs> I don't, you uh, don't, you don't know where his house is. That would be impressive if you could figure yeah, out where his house that's is. That's true. That's true. I think I would, you know, it's like I, I said to one of my friends, you know, I was going to, uh, Nancy Pelosi spoke at Brown when I was speaking there. Uh, she spoke to the undergrads and I spoke to the grad. And I was like, I wonder how many like secret service people know exactly what I had for breakfast like three days ago, <laughs> like yeah. back in San Diego. But anyway, let me just finish up. Um, so the military, they say this one is none, two is one, you know, three is two or something like, meaning like if you just have one, a uh, bullet or one gun, like you're basically screwed. If that thing fails, you're it's done. You're over. If you have two, you have a backup, and then you can lose one or one can break. Or maybe so. My you idea know, was. But to- but by the way, I just want to say there's an, an, yeah. an interesting analogy in venture capital or in business in general. And if you tell me that you're gonna um you you're burn you have you have a million dollars left and your burn rate is a hundred thousand dollars a month, so you'll run out of money in ten months, then. You, what that and this is similar to the one is none. You're already bankrupt. Yes, exactly. That's like, right. You're you're not going right. to your business is over. 100%. Like you're not going to survive. So and there's and, or or if you say I, I need to raise money within six months, then I would say you've already not raised money. Like it's, yep. it's done. So one of the one of the ideas I have is not buy one dialogue, buy two. So we there you can buy two or compass or whatever or, or origin of species. You buy two and like you said. You then the 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 Dow votes on what when to sell, if to sell, 
uh, you know, the one copy that will end up paying if there's some appreciation for some ROI for them. In other words, it guarantees, as long as you believe in the theory that this is going to go up, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very uh, restricted asset. And, you know, there's scarcity and so forth. All the properties of money apply to these books in, in, in far greater value, as I said, as I showed a Scooty is worth nothing today. You could drop me a pound of Scooty and it won't be worth nothing. A pound of Galileo books is worth an infinite amount of money potentially. So anyway, my idea is the Dow buys uh, two copies of every single book or maybe even more. But you know, now we're talking about millions of dollars, as you said. But um, but the ultimate thing, James, and, and, and I have to run to meet with a funding agent right now. So that's the ultimate thing, right? I want to someday be my own funding agent with this Dow or whatever. But I want, to th I want you to think about, and maybe we can talk about next, you know, I don't want it to be like, oh, well, here's the first time we split the atom and, and here's an image, you know, or here's an image of the James Webb telescope and sell that. Like, I want to do something. How would we fund science using some kind of DAO or NFT concept? You know, this book idea it makes sense. And I think that I could put that together with somebody's help. Uh, but, you know, well, think, actually think like funding, oh, this, I looked down a microscope and I saw this image of a bacteria. Now I'm selling it. I don't think that I don't think that's good for science. No, but, but, but uh, if this is funding science, how about all the papers, the academic papers that come out about it? Uh, all the names of the people who, uh, are, you know, are in the N Dow DAO mint uh, are appear on the academic papers of these great uh, discoveries. Yeah, well, as, as co-authors. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Or in the acknowledgments, they couldn't be co-authors, but they could be in the acknowledgments. Why that's can't they good... be co-authors? What's because the rule? Because authorship is, you know, has to do with vetting and contribution to a paper. It demeans the contribution of the actual scientist to add someone as an author. Okay. In fact, this happened once where there's a guy named um, Alfer and uh, Gamov, where these two uh, physicists, Al uh, Ralph Alfer, was this graduate student of uh, of Hans uh, of George Gamov. Um, and uh, they discovered how the lightest elements in the periodic table are formed. And uh, and Gamov had this funny sense of humor. He said, there's this guy, Hans Beta, and I want to involve him. So the paper will be called the Alpha Beta Gamov paper, which sounds like <laughs> a, B, uh, you know, a, B, C in Greek. And this poor guy, Alpha, had to go along with it because his thesis advisor forced him to. And the guy Beta did nothing. And it's now called this paper. And uh, Beta won the Nobel Prize but neither of the other two did. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Anyway, we don't want that to happen. But uh, but anyway, James, I, I love talking to you. But think about how you could do it in an equitable way so that scientists feel uh, they get, like imagine, you know, my friend Eric Weinstein, your um, our mutual friend, he's like, well, we should have taxed, you know, emails or tax, you know, but anything you tax gets, you know, lower. Yeah, I'm surprised than, Eric would say that. That doesn't sound I, very I think he was just saying, he was like, physicists return, like we need to demand money. And I say, the time to demand it is before you invent it. Like, in other words, let's establish what this thing is going to be capable of doing. You buy in now so that I have an upside guarantee. Like, I'm going to invent the laser. You can't go back and say, well, physicists invented the laser, the transistor, the internet, now pay us back. That's never going to work. But if you say ahead of time without holding it hostage, Anyway, these are all totally speculative and, and probably unorthodox and, and, and unethical for me to even talk about as a scientist. But I do feel and fear that U.S. scientific dominance is slipping for a variety of reasons that I don't want to get into. But we are losing our dominance to other nations. And we don't have to. Uh, but it's all for a lack of lack of agility and funding. No, but this is an interesting idea. And this is, this is part of the reason why crypto is very interesting is because yeah. what's happening right now is that we're experiencing this monetary inflation. And that's because an enormous amount of dollar bills were printed. What you're saying is, hey, there are specific use cases for currencies. Mm -hmm. And so let's make a use, let's make a specific currency where the use case is scientific development. So you'll increase the money supply, but there won't be monetary inflation because there's going to be scientific innovation that comes out of it that will in itself mm -hmm. grow the economy. If the economy grows in rate with the money supply, you don't get inflation. So that's what right. you're saying is, but but this mm -hmm. is one way to look at cryptocurrencies is that it solves the issue of increasing the money supply without having inflation, but spurring on innovation instead. And that's what you're proposing. And look, the U.S., the government should consider or companies should consider raising money in this way. And it's very important. I think it's going to take a long time if we wait for countries or companies to do it. I think individuals should do it. You see how much money they raise for the – and by the way, this is what's so frustrating. So they raise all this money for the Constitution Dow. And then what was it? Steve Schwartzman? He comes in, swoops in, uh, Rubenstein Rubenstein. just buys it up, and then he's going to keep it in some museum or whatever. Um, same with Bill Gates. Bill Gates. He's been on the podcast. No, I know. Uh, yeah, 
Whatever, like the, I'm not gonna, yeah. uh, and say anything. Hey, I mean, he can do whatever he wants. But it, it didn't. It had this huge groundswell, and and I don't know how they're giving back the money because the gas fees are higher than you know returning it. But um, and I don't want that to happen. But I would love it if we had a um way of doing it that is open, transparent, and accountable. Do it the exact same way they did it. Find like ten books, your ten <laughs> absolute mm-hmm. favorite scientific masterpieces from. Do you know from the history. guys that did that? Because I, I don't know them. I, I know of them. I, I know, but but it's not a hard thing to do. Okay, it it takes literally like a few days to to set up the entire okay. structure for this. So so, but first thing is find the books you want to buy. I already know them. Find out every what the book price by is. Darwin, every first edition by Galileo, every first edition by Newton, and every first edition by Einstein. That, that's my starting. You know, four or five. Buy two copies of each one and uh, sell one and keep one. But then I have to think about where am I going to okay, keep? Then, I don't want to keep them. You know, in my office here. I want to put them in a in a vault. No, no, you, you put them in. A, Put them in a museum. Yeah. So then we have to donate to the museum, them. and then how do we get that? No, 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 no. You don't have to donate. You lend. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about it next yeah, time. I have to it. meet with a funding agent right now, and uh, this is awesome. Okay. And he's, uh, you know, uh, he's a, he's a good friend as well. So James, thank you so much, and uh, let me know when we can thank talk you, again. Right, and where and can, pe- can people buy the Galileo? Yeah, book it's on, on my, it's on the same website that you can get the NFT. Uh, that's on briankeating.com slash dialogue. But the uh, meteorite you can get uh, by going to enter the chance to win it, uh, the fragment of a meteorite, by going to briankeating.com slash list. And now I'll put all the information in my mailing list. So that's where people get it. You can get it on Audible. You can get it on uh, iBooks. It's everywhere. Along with my other two books, Losing Excellent. the Nobel Prize and Think Like a Nobel Prize winner with forward by Nobel Prize winner Barry Barish and a man by the name of James, James Alton. Oh, I got to put that in my collection of books where I've written oh, the If we're ever too, together again, that. man, it's been like eight years since we were in the same room together. TEDx. Come visit uh, I will. Atlanta. I'll come visit you. I'll sleep on Let's do a TEDx I'll sleep Atlanta. On Jay's couch. Yeah, let's hook it up. No, I, I, got, I got a room just for you. It's called the Brian Keating Room. Pandora makes it easy for you to find your favorite music. Discover new artists and genres by selecting any song or album and we'll make you a personalized station for free. Download on the Apple App Store or Google Play and enjoy the soundtrack to your life. Welcome back to our studio where we have a special guest with us today, Toucan Sam from Fruit Loops. Toucan Sam, welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, and um, it's Fruit Loops, just so you know. Uh, fruit. Fruit. Yeah, fruit. No, it's Fruit Loops. The same way you say studio. That's not how we say it. Fruit Loops, find the loopy side. <laughs> 